Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Meeting the Roach Traveling Scholars Emerging Projects. My name is Peter Wiederspun. I am the Vice President of the Roach and your co-host tonight, and I'm joined by Megan Panzano, who is the Secretary of the Roach. And we will also meet our two most recent Roach scholars, David Costanza and Kyle Barker, who will provide overviews of their Roach competition proposals and development process, uh, as well as discuss their experiences as they are during a pandemic, being involved with the Roach Traveling Scholarship. Just a little bit of history of the Roach Traveling Scholarship. In fact, it's a long history. It's the longest history of any architectural design competition in the United States. It was founded in 1883 um, and has been awarding scholars funds to travel worldwide uh, ever since then. And um, the uh, el eligibility requirements are for US citizens who have obtained a professional degree, a Bachelor of Architecture or a Master of Architecture degree from an accredited school within the last 10 years. And there are uh, one, and the other requirement, if you will, is that you have a connection to Massachusetts. The Roach family was a, uh, a Massachusetts, Boston based family that um, started the, the scholarship. And uh, so the, uh, the um, guidelines, the bylaws speculate or um, uh, uh, insist that you have either a full time professional experience in a Massachusetts architectural firm or that you have received an accredited degree from one of the accredited schools of architecture in Massachusetts. For more information on the Roach Traveling Scholarship, you can visit the BSA website at architects.org or you can go directly to the Roach Traveling Scholarship website at roach.org. Just a little bit of background about the process of becoming a, win uh, a winner uh, of the Roach Traveling Scholarship. Um, we solicit applications that are due in January. Um, we actually will look through the eligibility requirements for each applicant and notify people uh, if they are eligible or if they are not. Um, and then there are two design competitions, and this is unique to the Roach Traveling Scholarship. Many traveling scholarships are kind of an application or a portfolio process. This is a two-stage design competition. It is a fairly rigorous process, and both Kyle and David can attest to that, and, and they will in just a few minutes. Um, the first competition is basically a weekend long. It starts Friday and ends on Monday, and that gives you a weekend to prepare uh, a, uh, approximately two boards. Um, sometimes those requirements will change from year to year, um, and that is a, an anonymous jury. So out of all of the applicants that uh, participate in the preliminary competition, we select generally between five and six finalists. And so those five or six people are then joined by the runner up from the previous year. And I'll explain that in a minute. Um, and so all of those finalists then have basically two weekends in a full week, a, a, a 10 day period in which to participate in the final jury um, or the final competition. And that's in, in March. And then by the end of March, the Roach Traveling Scholarship will assemble a, a jury and um, invite the uh, uh, participants to come to Boston if there isn't a pandemic uh, and present their work directly uh, to that jury. Uh, and at the end of all of those presentations, then the, the jurors will deliberate and then announce that very evening who the winner and the runner up will be. And so uh, the winner, of course, is uh, uh, receives a stipend for travel, and that travel needs to begin by the end of that calendar year, again, unless there's a pandemic. And so 
uh, David Costanza, who is our 2020 winner, actually just began his travel and he visits us tonight. It is midnight, somewhere between Treviso and uh, Venice, Italy. Um, and we're really delighted that uh, David is, uh, is joining us tonight. Um, um, the, just to continue the idea of the runner-up, the advantage of the runner-up is that in the subsequent year, you get a buy from the preliminary and are invited directly into the final competition. Um, there have been instances where the finalist, the winner, has not been able to travel. And in those cases, the uh, runner-up will then become the winner. So then in those cases, we have two winners in that year. Uh, and the person who was the runner-up will then receive that stipend and, um, and proceed with that uh, travel. So that travel um, is um, not only do you have to present to the Roach Traveling Scholarship Committee an itinerary for your travel, but also a research agenda. So the expectation is that you will have a specific research agenda. You will use that travel to fulfill that agenda. And when you complete your travel, you will make a report, which is a pretty wide open proposition. But nonetheless, we collect all of those reports and they are stored at the MIT Library Archive. So with that, I would like to uh, formally introduce our two guests tonight. So David Costanza, as I said, was the winner of the Roach Traveling Scholarship in 2020. Um, and he's currently just begun his travel. And of course, in extenuating circumstances like a pandemic or social unrest, the travelers, the scholars are in constant contact with the Roach Traveling uh, uh, scholarship board and the, and the Roach Committee uh, to make sure that everybody is safe. And so this year and last year, we let the winners decide when they felt it was safe. And so the schedule is slightly different this year. Um, but nonetheless, it looks like uh, the world is getting to be a safer place and David has um, decided to begin his travel. And it, it's also a great pleasure to introduce Kyle Barker, who's a senior associate at Merge Architects, a um, adjunct professor at Northeastern University, where I also teach, and is the 2021 uh, Roach Traveling Scholarship. One thing I will add is that both David and Kyle were runners up before they were winners. And this is actually a fairly um, a consistent story. Not all people have done the Roach more than once, but uh, some have. And uh, that is always a great way to get used to the rhythm of the competition and, uh, and to ultimately get it. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to David Costanza and he'll present his uh, experiences with the Roach. Hello. Hopefully you can all hear me. Um, thanks, Peter, for the introduction. Let's see. Let's step back. Um, I wanted to, I mean, first, it's very exciting to share the work. Uh, when I presented uh, in spring of 2020, we had originally planned to actually present in person. And that is just as things were starting to shut down at the beginning of spring. And the presentation was delayed and eventually we started the virtual format. And so it's really great to share the work to a larger audience. Uh, I think so far only the jury has really seen this proposal. So uh, I'll largely present my uh, proposal for the second round competition for the 2020 uh, scholarship. But I, I maybe will elaborate really quickly on a few comments that Peter brought up, and I'm sure Kyle um, will expand on these. Um, but it, it's been a kind of a long process uh, applying to the Roch competition. I think my first application was in 2016. And uh, each time I think I've made it one step further in the process, but it's been a kind of a, a long uh, and rewarding process. And I think for you know, those of us, especially that are involved in academia or working full time, uh, those 10 days go by really quickly. <laughs> and uh, that weekend's often uh, quite busy as well. So trying to balance um, you know, these sort of competitions with uh, 
other preoccupations makes it particularly challenging. Um, but it's been a been a really great process. Um, I maybe we'll just go ahead and jump in. Uh, I'll share essentially starting with the prompt um, to kind of give you a quick overview. Uh, I'll go through my proposal and then talk a little bit about my uh, very recent travel plans just as things have uh, started to open up. I kind of jumped on the opportunity. So, uh, a brief overview. This is from the round two prompt, which was titled On Display. Uh, and I'll start maybe with a short quote from that prompt. Uh, the Ratch program brief asked participants to design a museum of and for architecture. The artifact on display, in other words, is the architecture itself. The brief prompts participants to consider the role the museum plays within the 21st century urban environment most broadly, and to take a, uh, sorry, a stand on the role of architecture's iconicity, as well as its impact in shaping culture and history. And uh, to contextualize this, I think it's on the third board, but the museum was sited adjacent to Copley Square in Boston. I think all of my prompts for the Roch have all been Boston-based, um, uh, coincidentally. All right, so the design approach for the Architecture Museum was to treat the building as both gallery and display. The initial ambition was to use the building itself to communicate the materials and histories of the discipline of architecture. And in doing so, the museum, museum becomes an instrument for learning. In response to the four types of gallery spaces, the building stacks vertically both material and spatial typologies. The galleries range in the types of objects on display, as well as the associated spaces necessary to house those artifacts from full-scale architectural replicas to scaled models. Those spatial implications are then mapped onto four different material systems and resulting structural grids. Beginning with the site plan, the first design move was to define a horizontal line across the site. The line which runs from one corner of the site to the midpoint of the opposing edge produces a north facing skylight that illuminates the depth of the building. The skylight, which is offset and repeated, starts to organize the roof as well as the subsequent plans below. Moving down through the stack museum, the large full-scale galleries are housed at the top of the building, using steel as the structural system and channel glass as the envelope on the fourth floor. The horizontal line of the skylight above divides the plan into two zones. Directly below the skylight, the line is manifest as a thick wall that ties the stacked programs together. The wall divides the gallery spaces, which are oriented towards the street from the back of house program. Moving around the wall, you discover the restrooms, fire escape stair, as well as the commuter and freight elevators. Moving into the space, the skylight above the gallery is constructed with long span steel trusses. The trusses are exposed and dictate the location of the steel columns along the facade. The top gallery is one of two galleries dedicated to the display of full-scale architectural objects. In this image, the exhibition of timber structures exploits the scale of the gallery to compare post and beam timber versus light frame wood construction. In the left, the large wall defined by the skylight, which splits the plan is visible and slipping around the wall, the back of house program can be accessed. Parallel to the wall, the primary public circulation cuts obliquely across the stack program through an oversized straight run staircase. The second plan shifts from steel to precast concrete capable of creating large ceiling heights and massive spans. With the shift from steel trusses to precast concrete beams, columns are inserted which pick up the spans and start to suggest possible configurations for the gallery. The facade is also made of precast concrete with insulated glass units. In the gallery, the vast space completes the required full-scale architectural exhibition program. The shift from channel glass to vision glass ties the gallery back to the city, allowing for views to the adjacent context. The current exhibition of classical ruins exploits the full space of the gallery. The primary circulation is painted dark gray to contrast the galvanized steel above, the marble wall, and the lighter precast concrete. 
The first floor plan shifts again from precast concrete to mass timber. The columns continue to expand in cross section and additional interior structures required to divide the spans. The reduced span and ceiling height accommodate scaled models and a more intimate gallery space. The facade is lined with thin wood louvers, which diffuse the light into the gallery and allows for a monolithic reading from the exterior. An offset of the stair produces the primary circulation outside of the gallery zones. Entering the first floor gallery, which is sized to exhibit scaled architectural models and prototypes, the wood structure participates in the display, producing model stands between the structure. In this case, scaled geometric objects, which explore material and form are on display. A scale model of the museum itself defines the edge of the gallery space. The elevated model represents the datum of the ground, the above ground and below ground program, as well as the distinctive skylights which illuminate the galleries. The four stacked material systems are explicit in the model, steel, concrete, wood, and stone. Returning to the ground floor plan, the shift from timber to stone further reduces the column spacing and increases the cross section, resulting in a nested urban landscape that steps down to create an entrance plaza, museum shop, and urban exhibition space. The primary entrance to the site is on the right or the east side of the building. Here, the entrance allows for a straight cut across the plan at grade. Moving down either through the ramped landscape or stepped interior, the primary entrance is defined by an entire facade of thresholds, which allows the program to spill out from the building into the sunken plaza. The lower elevation of the plaza separates one from the speed and intensity of the street while allowing for views back to the adjacent context in Copley Square. To facilitate the entrance and exterior plaza on the ground, the building steps back on the ground and first floor producing a covered exterior urban space. Entering the building from the sunken plaza, the step space introduces a hierarchy and organization to the otherwise open plan. The stone wall ties into the floor and to the columns on the ground level. The stone also extends past the facade to the adjacent exterior urban spaces. To the left, the two public circulations are visible. The ascending staircase to the elevated galleries in the background and in the foreground, the descending staircase to the galleries below. Aligned with the axis of the stair, one can see either to the top gallery made of steel and illuminated through large skylights or down to the media gallery and the auditorium below. The two straight run stairs are of equal width and stacked to facilitate above ground and below ground circulation. The digital media gallery is located just below the urban. The subterranean conditions found here are conducive to the light sensitive forms of display and projection. The perpendicular concrete walls act as display surface for hanging or projecting digital media. In addition, the space below the public plaza becomes the museum storage. The exhibition gallery receives indirect illumination through the stair opening. The edge of the stone wall is visible to the right. The half round profile allows the wall to float within the space. To the right of the image, the back of house space is still visible. The current gallery utilizes the walls as display surface for a video installation, which explores the aesthetics of architecture and projected future media. Finally, the primary auditorium is positioned to negotiate the lowest two floors. To access the top of the auditorium, one exits the straight run stair toward the middle and the bottom of the stepped auditorium aligns with the end of the stair at the lowest level. The elevation and subsequent sections tell the story of the building. The stacked galleries, which expand as they ascend, are clearly visible. The stacked straight run stairs, which parallel the stone wall, visibly tie the various galleries together. And the horizontal line of the skylights is revealed in the section because of the rotation between the building and the north facing skylights, the cut reads as two uh, in the front elevation and four serrations in the cross section. Finally, the short cantilever produced between the ground floor and the second floor defines the urban exterior space, which is covered by the stepped plants. The axonometric of the building and the structure reinforce the densification of the structure and envelope. 
In this way, the building itself communicates the materials and histories of the discipline of architecture, from the stacked stone construction through the timber post and beam, the reinforced precast concrete, and finally the thinness and apparent lightness of the steel columns and steel trusses. In doing so, the museum itself becomes an instrument for learning, augmenting the galleries and exhibition spaces in the Museum for Architecture. Thank you. Thanks, David. That was really wonderful. Uh, I was reminded in one of your images that the, the, the one time, maybe the first time that the jury realized what the building actually looked like was one of the models on the model floor. And it's just a, such a, a poignant and, and kind of powerful moment. It's almost like a whisper where everyone has to lean in and, and understand. I really, really loved that project. Kyle. You're up next. Just, right. just so sorry, Kyle, before you, before you hop in. Thank you so much, David. It was great to see that work um, again after such a such a time. And I'm happy that you're, um, you know, addressing your own research now through travel as well. Um, please, everybody, load into the chat. We'll have a chance to have a conversation and direct those questions to both David and Kyle following Kyle's presentation. So. Um, I'm keeping track of it and we'll be guiding a discussion to follow. So please feel free to load questions there. Kyle, <laughs> it's your floor. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so uh, as David mentioned, I have entered this a lot of times. <laughs> I can definitely sympathize with him. So the way I structured the presentation was I'm gonna talk about uh, this year's project in more detail and then use the second bit of the time to just kind of give you a sampling of the previous entries. I thought for those of you that are interested in entering this in the future, um, it might be inspiring to see how many times I tried. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna get into it. So uh, the prompt for this year was to uh, design a data center for an abandoned dry dock in the seaport. Um, the data center was supposed to include a museum um, and to provide a reason for the public to visit this site. So um, to give you a sense of the scale of the dry dock, it was about the size of a football field. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of scale and complexity for 10 days. Um, and uh, for those of you that may not be acquainted, acquainted with the data center typology, uh, these buildings are typically kind of warehouse style buildings. Um, rows and rows of servers. They typically have a hot side and a cold side, um, which is to make the heating and cooling more efficient. So they're really driven by the heating and cooling loads. So conventionally, these have been, uh, you try to minimize the surface area of the building um, to minimize the heat loads, but there have been a lot of advances in the last decade. So uh, what I did uh, when I got the brief was I did a little research on data centers and discovered that uh, the last few years, uh, this new type of data center has emerged uh, with a technology called direct-to-chip cooling. So basically, instead of heating the entire space, they're using water uh, in a tube to direct the cooling right at the point that it's needed to the processor. So I was asking questions like, how would that change the shape of a building? Um, and so I think when you make that shift from heating with water versus air, it changes the building fundamentally. And so instead of minimizing the surface area of the building or the envelope, you actually want to maximize it. So with that point of departure, uh, I designed a data center that operates as one single meandering row. And so what you're seeing uh, in these diagrams on the right, so I'm going to zoom in on the top one, um, so this outline is the dry dock itself. This is the, uh, the spot where ships used to go. And so what I'm doing in the project is filling this up with filtered seawater and then having this single meandering row of data uh, float within that on a series of pontoons. So it still has a hot side and a cool side. So the hot side faces in to create a series of pools. Uh, to basically utilize that waste heat. Those pools go from being small and incredibly hot 
to large and temperate, and I'm going to get into that in more detail later. Um, because this project, you know, raises so many questions about, uh, you know, how do we deal with, you know, this kind of new typology? How do we deal with a site where climate change is going to be you know, a very serious reality? Um, I wanted to take the physics of this very seriously. So what this drawing is showing is kind of how the whole thing works. And what you're seeing to orient you is this is a slice through the project. So you're seeing basically an Olympic sized pool in the foreground. Uh, you're seeing a greenhouse in the background, which we'll talk about more later. You're seeing a elevated running track overhead. And then this small area in the middle is the data center. So uh, this is the dock with the pontoons that allows it to float in this filtered seawater. Uh, you would climb down this essentially submarine hatch into at this area, it's 16 feet tall. So that also varies across the project. Uh, but when you clamber down that ladder, you would have basically the servers on, on your one side um, and then essentially nothing on the other. So to zoom out, what actually is happening in the walls of that is that you have this closed loop radiant system. So the way it works is you have cold water that runs through the walls. Uh, it runs up behind the server uh, directly to them. So as it does that, it takes that waste heat and it transfers it into the bottom of the pool. So when you're in the pool, you can look down and see these radiant tubes, which are giving off heat. Um, but because they're embedded, you can't touch them. So to give you a sense of the overall plan and <laughs> to convey how large it is, uh, what you're seeing here uh, in this kind of middle zone, which I'll zoom in a bit. So that is a quarter mile running track to just scale it for you. So uh, what you have on the site is in this center, uh, again, what was formerly where they worked on the ships is the data center itself. That's bracket on both sides uh, by the greenhouses. Um, and the point of the greenhouses was that in any system you're going to have like this, you're going to have waste heat. So uh, the waste heat powers these 100 foot tall pneumatic greenhouses. Um, so we'll see that in, there, in the views in a second. Um, but this is where you would enter the site from. This is Boston Harbor on this side. Um, and one other key thing about this project is that it's part of the Boston Harbor Walk, but this site is actually the only break in the Harbor Walk, uh, which starts all the way in Charlestown. So part of the idea of this running track was to relink the Harbor Walk. Um, and because Boston is such a city of runners, creating a running track uh, seemed like an homage to that. Um, the running track is 40 feet in the air. So to get up there, you have these series of meandering ramps that are a quarter mile in themselves on both sides, which create uh, kind of a rhythm for the greenhouses. Now to get into the pool, so going uh, from the south to the north of the site, you start at a series of thermal baths. So in kind of all the images to come, you'll see a render view, a section, and a plan. So what you're seeing in this first bit is that you have uh, a series of pools that go from kind of single serving hot tub size up to larger communal pools. Um, and the idea with all of these experiences was to kind of bring these exciting possibilities exist all over the world to Boston um, in this kind of heightened reality that's possible when you have this much waste heat to make use of. So to zoom in on that section, this is another uh, part of the project where uh, you can see that the server areas are shorter. So at this point in the project, they're actually only four feet tall, uh, which is calibrated to one server rack. And these between them, you can see uh, this series of pools, which is going from incredibly hot to cooler as it moves to the north. The next uh, kind of series of programs is a, uh, a public bath. So I thought it was fun to bring in something like Japanese bathing, which is traditionally done in the nude, to a city like Boston, which is known for being a little puritanical. Um, so to, to kind of merge these two worlds, I've censored all the scalies here. But the thing that I was really excited about was because uh, the server and these meandering rows uh, have to not make too sharp of bends, it creates a formal language that is used across all of the pools. So while previously we had these 
individualized pools, now you can see that it's making larger meandering communal pools. Um, what this also does is allow for people that are more introverted um, or people that are more extroverted to be in the center of these. Um, you know, this comes with all the normal stuff like locker rooms, as well as additional locker rooms that are for general public use. The next series of pools, so in the image on the left, you're standing in the kiddie pool, looking to the water park beyond. Uh, the brief called for a museum about the data that was supposed to house a large ship. So you're seeing the ship in plan here. And so that pops up on the building, which becomes a perfect armature for a water slide. Uh, so to zoom in on the section here, uh, there are a few spots in the project where the servers actually touch and there's no uh, water between them. So at those moments, you have spots like this where you have these continuously running outdoor showers uh, or here in front of the museum, a splash pad uh, to make use of evaporative cooling. The last of the pools is an Olympic size Um, and uh, because these pneumatics, so again, the waste heat from the servers is being used to power these inflatable greenhouses. Uh, because Boston gets hot and these are going to be up all year, those would naturally build up pressure. So the idea was that that excess pressure powers an artificial geyser, which gives you that evaporative cooling. It's a nice homage to the whales in the harbor. Um, and so that's what you're seeing in the distance here, uh, which can obviously be viewed from the pool or from the elevated track. So there's the, there's the Kaiser there. Um, the other thing, so I mentioned the, the greenhouses. So I wanted to think about how people could, again, this idea of heightened reality. So I like the idea of coming to Boston to visit the tropics. Uh, so you enter the greenhouse, uh, which is this lush environment, and you can experience the trees both from the bottom, but as you meander your way up this track, uh, you can view them from canopy height, uh, which is what you're seeing here. You punch through it and pass over the pool. So you're seeing uh, you know, a swimming event going in the short direction of the pool, the observers there. Uh, and then on the other side, the south side of the site is the desert. So it's the only place outside of Arizona that you can see a uh, giant saguaro cactus, uh, again, from both kind of the top or the bottom. So here you are, a little cowboy looking at the cacti. Um, so with any kind of project about data centers, because they have such high security demands going on inside, which is one of the challenges of the brief, and so I thought there were really two good opportunities to do this. One is the basement of the museum. So what you're seeing in this image is that in, you know, in a secure environment, you can view through the museum, which is having an exhibition on data centers, through to the actual data center, and then through that into the uh, shallow end of the swimming pool. So what you're seeing is you get that kind of summer Olympic swim cam view, and you can interact with people that are outside. Uh, but those people can also kind of view in and see the glow of the data. Similarly, uh, the hatches that I mentioned earlier that access the data, the idea was that those would have a tempered glass top. And so you would not be able to see the data, but you would be able to experience its glow. So it becomes almost like a series of um, ambient lighting around the site. So as I mentioned earlier, I was at it for a long time. I think data said he started in 2016. I started in 2015 with a few years off. Um, I was a finalist three times. I was a runner up the year before I was the winner. Uh, and I participated twice without making the next round. So I'm gonna give you a super crash course of those six. Um, the first one, which is admittedly very bad. And I only, this is all that remains because I had a server, uh, a hard, like a backup drive crash. Um, this was downtown crossing. Um, it was a civic building that was supposed to have a skate park, a space for food trucks and an art gallery, um, as well as having an idea about that path that connects from downtown crossing to State Street and how you could view activity above from there.
does a lot for three days. <laughs> but the my idea was basically to flip the section of what you would expect to put the skate park on top to get kind of the sculptural sectional um, possibilities from that. The second one uh, was called Thick House. This was a preliminary round. And the idea was to create essentially the house of the future, but there were strict rules about how much it could weigh. Um, and it used the glass house as being a canonical, you know, 60s kind of style home. So what would that be for today? Um, and so the idea was to create something that was incredibly thick, um, kind of a la passive house, in this case, um, with a particular type of concrete. Um, I used Philip Johnson to be funny at the time, but he's canceled, so I've, I've crossed him out now. Um, and this is just showing how the panels of the system work, which um, after competing in this time, I was really excited about the project. So I kept going with it. And so this is kind of the after stuff that I've done um, developing that idea further. The third project, so this was, I. I that last one, I was a finalist that year. Um, and there was a really incredibly hard project cited on Government Center. Um, it was a giant civic building. And um, I'm not gonna get into this details, but I think the funny thing about this competition is that you get, it's such an intense 10 days and you are not supposed to talk with anyone about it. So you're in your own world. And I did not even realize that I was riffing off the Hancock building so incredibly hard. I mean, it is a parallelogram plan. It's a thing that's hard to do in Boston without invoking that. Um, but essentially, the idea was that Government Center is a series of concrete brutalist buildings. Um, they were using concrete for its kind of sculptural qualities. So what I thought would be interesting to dialogue with them was to use concrete in a totally different way. So how could you make concrete look as thin as possible? So I got really nerdy about slab details and cutting it back to make it all kind of dematerialized. Um, and what I was excited about in the project, um, outside of the, the plan and the thinking about a kind of triangular uh, waffle slab, uh, was this idea that as you moved up through the buildings, there were these various public programs uh, that could house things ranging from CrossFit to you know spontaneous 70 person dinners. So it was an idea about how does the public interface with government? And it asked a lot of questions about what does government mean? Um, Jennifer Lee won this year. If you haven't seen her project, you should check it out because it was very incredible. Um, this was a year that I didn't, I entered but didn't, didn't make it past the first round. Uh, the brief was on a uh, two parcels, incredibly long thin site and it was for uh, three housing units and some other amenity. So to make use of that site, I created kind of a promenade greenhouse um, and a single family building with kind of three towers. The thinking was that this could be basically multi-generational housing. This was another one where I was excited about it. And so I revisited afterward and I had made so many iterations and I had kind of baked one that it, in hindsight wasn't the right one. So uh, this was just kind of exploring the further potential of the project um, and fleshing out some of the ideas that I didn't get to in the initial three days. Um, the biggest one was that I love the idea of being able to like pick a coconut from your bedroom window. So this was um, 2000, or so this is the one that, that David won. Um, this was the first round, which he had a buy for. So again, it was actually a very similar site to that previous year, um, but it was to do an accessory dwelling unit. And so it had to be, I think, three accessory dwelling units in the backyard and existing triple decker. And so I got really excited about the idea of how could we like, atomize a triple decker into something where you could rent essentially a room, but have access to shared amenities, like a kind of uh, restaurant quality kitchen that you share with your neighbors and thus can reduce rent while having uh, easy access to outdoor space. So these are the kind of rendered views of that and a diagram explaining how that works. This is another one that I took further afterward, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna burden you guys with that tonight. And then lastly, this is the one that David uh, presented on. Um, and I have to say, I, it was amazing to hear you present it, David. Um, I think a fun thing that we realized fairly quickly was that we had similar concepts. 
um, executed in different ways. So uh, the idea here was that um, there were these different artifacts that David touched on. So you had to have something that could exhibit building scaled artifacts, uh, models, and the digital. And there were things in between that. But uh, what I did in this project was that it, it goes from being like a 35 foot high ceiling at the first floor, the ground level, uh, up to 11 at the top. And as it shrinks in section, uh, the spans also shrink. So you go from these kind of uh, incredibly, this is a worm, like a worm's eye isometric. So looking from below. So you have these like giant clear spans on the lowest level to like I called it castellated atrium on the second to hypostyle waffle ceiling on the third to forest of columns on the fourth to uh, like CLT on the lot on the fifth. So this is just kind of a quick journey through that. I put in my previous round. This was like my little winky, winky thing that I put in my previous round as a proof of like that you could actually you know, this exhibit architecture on that lowest level. Um, there's an atrium to the first floor that allows you to kind of see those exhibits from many vantage points. Moving up to the third floor, this was where you display the models. Um, this was also, there was an archive program as part of it. Uh, similar to David, I got nerdy about designing the exhibits because it's hard to resist. Uh, going up to the fourth floor, this was like a traditional kind of mill building post and beam. The fifth floor, or what I called the uh, timber renaissance. So this was the enfilade. The center of this was for the digital exhibitions. Uh, and then lining the perimeter was uh, a series of oculi. And those pop up on the roof uh, to create like kind of a figural field. It could have rooftop exhibitions, parties, uh, and basically give the public access to uh, outdoor space. So that's it. So I call it 42 days for the win because <laughs> it's 42 days of competing in the roach. That's great. Oh, wow. Um, thank you. Thank you both so much for, for sharing. I mean, just the, it's, it's just astounding, honestly, the kind of distillation of so much careful thought and commitment to final projects. And Kyle, even with some of your preliminary um, pass rounds in the mix, it's just really, really lovely to see across the set. So thank you both so much. Um, I'm gonna start taking some questions from the chat to pose to both of you, but I'm gonna pick one up, um, a version of one that was already mentioned as a kind of way of a beginning conversation. Um, so I would encourage everyone to, to continue to load in questions as they come. But um, both for you, Kyle, and for you, David, um, one of the things that, that I find through years of involvement with this um, that really distinguishes the Roach Traveling Scholarship as an award is that, as Peter mentioned, um, it's a two-stage competition with unique briefs that are drafted each year for a competition participants to respond to. But the awardees proposal for travel and research that follows is decoupled from those brief prompts, right? So it's, you win based on your creative response to, to the briefs, but then you're able to have real agency in crafting a kind of traveling research plan that's an extension of things that you yourself as an awardee are interested in. So I'm hopeful that Kyle and David, you guys could speak a little bit to the personal projects that are maybe extending from your, your Roach Award, um, David in 2020, Kyle in 2021, um, just kind of unpack a little bit for us kind of what you're planning. I know, I know in Kyle's case, it's very, very preliminary and that's fine, but you know, what are you turning to? What are you looking at? <laughs> yeah, I can start um, since I've had a year uh, additional to think about it a little more. Um, I think something that was present, well, first it's a really interesting and strange format for exactly those reasons that there is no travel proposal. Uh, it's two more or less blind design competitions that then result in a traveling scholarship, which is really, I think, but also unique and for a lot of reasons. Uh, for me, it was a really valuable 
kind of moment every year and <laughs> returning back to it as a way to work on a design project. I mean, frankly, teaching, um, I don't a kind of annual um, return to the Roch competition to take on a design project. And for me, it was very valuable um, over the last, yeah, as Kyle mentioned, maybe five years or so um, to do that. It also uh, kind of um, exercises a different portion of uh, our capacity as architects that from writing proposals and uh, submitting grants, which is, I feel like, what most of my life has become, uh, to actually being a designer. Um, and I, I really, yeah, appreciate that. So um, it's kind of strange, but uh, it's been really valuable. So, sorry, side note. Um, so that, maybe to, to pick up uh, on Megan's question, um, I mean, my my interest in research are around building materials, building construction. And that's something that's, I think, the way I find value uh, in the competition proposals that I've put forward. I mean, certainly for the Roch, but in others as well. So all of the proposals from the ones that were not accepted for the first round to the first round or final uh, finalist proposals from 2019 and uh, finally in 2020, all had a clear material agenda uh, and some logic as to um, construction and structure and architecture. That's very broad. <laughs> I can be more specific, but uh, it's something for me that uh, gives value to the proposals. Uh, they're not, in my opinion, formally exuberant in any way. They're really trying to express something else about how we might approach a design project through an understanding of materials and construction. So that was present certainly, I think, in the proposal. I think it's also curious, Kyle and I did not speak at all uh, and had similar sort of ideas about how materials could uh, play a larger role in a building dedicated to a museum for architecture. So uh, maybe our buildings had some overlap in that way or our proposals had some overlap in that way. Um, but that's certainly how I'm structuring my travel, or that's how I, my ambition to structure travel started with um, my interest in novel construction, particularly buildings that take on um, non-standard means of construction and non-standard materials. Um, I've kind of collected a large number of those kind of case studies. I've explored them through studios I've taught, seminars I've taught and was very eager to kind of experience them firsthand to meet with architects and to try and that um, you know, beyond the building itself, kind of manufacturers, factories, production facilities, where a lot of these buildings were, or components of the buildings were produced. Um, that's something I've been kind of collecting since I've won the competition uh, through the courses I've taught and my own research on the side. Um, as uh, I think Peter mentioned uh, in the intro, I've uh, just very, very recently, a few days ago, arrived um, uh, to Italy. Uh, it was one of the few countries or first countries to kind of open up to vaccinated travelers. So I just got here. <laughs> I'm still kind of working through uh, what's possible right now, hoping to visit as many of the uh, kind of projects from my list as possible over the summer. But because of the situation, understanding that the other half of this will come later, and hopefully at that point, uh, more places will be open. There are many countries that, uh, well, let me step back. I was hoping to structure the travel around non-Western uh, architecture. Uh, so not to simply travel in Europe, and particularly in Italy. Um, I was hoping to travel to um, to South America, to India, to Japan, and a few other places where I had collected most of my case studies. And so I've had to kind of retool that a bit, seeing that a lot of those places are not accessible, at least this summer, um, and hoping that I can visit those places and things will be in a better place uh, uh, during the second half of my travel. And then I know it's a long answer, but maybe the last thing I'll say 
because I, I noticed I didn't see all the comments because I was presenting, but I saw a few. Someone asked about, did you take 10 days off of work to do the competition? Sadly, I did not. I, I was teaching the whole time. So I, I had a full teaching load and I'm sure Kyle was teaching and working as well. So it's a tricky thing to balance. Um, it was done simultaneously. I think it was one or two weeks off from my spring break. So um, it was done simultaneously. Um, so it, it really, I think 42 days was is optimistic. I think it's more like a hundred hours, <laughs> um, but yeah, I'll, I'll, maybe Kyle can expand on some of that. I can say just before I pass the baton to Kyle, thank yeah. you, David. Yeah. We're so thrilled that you started your travel and we'll be kind of living vicariously through you in whatever duration of rolling out your plan um, comes. So it's really exciting to kind of be tracking along your research beginning now. Um, you know, we do for both stages of the competition have constraints set that in terms of deliverables. So it is a lot of time, but to the question of, did you take 10 days off work? Um, we as a Roach board and as a Roach committee comprised of local practitioners and, um, and educators in the Massachusetts area schools are very sensitive to also being able to make this available to as many people as possible. So we're always in conversation about what's the right deliverable set that, you know, what we profit, this is manageable with balance acts that go on all the time um, so that we invite as many people as we can to participate. So, um, it, you know, it's everyone kind of mirrors that themselves, but there are some constraints that keep it from, from requiring you to kind of let everything else go. I can say that. <laughs> all right, Kyle, if you want to share a little bit about what you're working on. Yeah, I think, um, I think the question is really interesting because like I, uh, I think if you had only known me from like my thesis in grad school, which was about uh, shared housing, I think you would have thought like, oh, that's what Kyle does and that's what he's interested in. I think I, I just like take these super meandering routes in life. <laughs> so I, that is what my topic is for my travel. Um, and I think, I think I like recommitted to that kind of over and over through my entries in, in the Roach. Like I think almost everyone had some aspect of co-living or, or um, I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the, prelim rounds were about housing or some form of housing, which I'm really passionate about. Um, so I think in thinking about, you know, how can we live together in different ways? How can we afford housing in really expensive places like Boston? I think I have gotten to some of the places that David is about, you know, getting back to kind of structure as an essential part of architecture. So uh, yeah, what I've outlined for my my travel is to look at alternative models of housing. And I really mean alternative models to single family homes and the way we think about them in the US, which I think are an important part of any housing mix. Um, yeah, so right now, I, similar to David, had a list of things I love and knew I loved. And then I also set off on a kind of research mission to find other ones that may not have existed. And I plotted them all out in Google Maps to see where they were, <laughs> trying to be fairly agnostic about the location. And it, I think it's gonna coalesce into two trips, one that would be Japan um, and Australia. Uh, there's a lot of inspiring stuff going on in Melbourne, um, in Tokyo. And then the other one, uh, I think, I don't know which direction it goes yet, but kind of south to north. Um, so going like Spain, France, Switzerland, Austria, Germany, Sweden, Norway. So the TV, TBC, but um, yeah, I mean, there's the, there's the additional challenge of Corona right now, but um, I think to that other question about taking time off work, I wish it had said like 42 days, probably more like a hundred hours. I really wish I was that good at design. <laughs> I think, I don't know how many hours I spent but I have been trying to be better about um, if our office manager was on the line, she would be like doing this. I'm trying to be better about tracking hours. And I spent 80 hours on the last one. So, um, cause I tracked it. So I did take a day off work to do that, but all the other times I didn't take any time off. That's great. It's so great to hear. I mean, I, I so appreciate both of your, your candidness because I think sharing what your design research projects are that the Roach is supporting through, through travel 
um, is it now looking back at your proposals, your final winning proposals, and in Kyle's case, those some of those that didn't make it, you know, it's wonderful to see a kind of um, productive ghost of these ideas, you know, material and construction in David's case. Um, and I had seen a preceding final uh, where you were runner up that, that addressed that too the, the year before. And in Kyle's case, to kind of see that trickle through, I think is really wonderful to use subsequent attempts to sort of tune up your own agenda, I think is really smart. Um, I have one more question, which actually starts to maybe pull in some of the, the question from Susan posed in the chat about um, sensitivity to place, um, you know, sensitivity to context versus monumentality, perhaps in a different scale. But, um, you know, one of the things that, that the Roach Traveling Scholarship, you know, um, explicitly supports is the ability to interact global issues, global perspectives on certain things that have to do with place, culture, and the built environment, to interact those things with a kind of Massachusetts-based way of doing things, right? Because you guys have been educated in this environment, you know, you've practiced in this area, you have a kind of rootedness, let's say, to Massachusetts approach. So maybe this is part of what Kyle is mentioning as a kind of like puritanical resistance or something <laughs> that this you know scholarship supports. But and likewise, um, it's a way of sort of inter, you know interfacing a, a Boston way of doing things with um, with the discovery or new questions you know that emerge from a kind of um, an itinerary that takes you out of kind of Western modes of thinking. So. Um, to that end, it, it's really rich because it supports something that's about broadening the scope or perspective of how we um, address design problems globally. How do you both think that you know, um, the discoveries made or the questions that emerge from your Roach travel and design research, how do you envision that being accessible to others later in your career? That could be through, this is not a call for you to necessarily right now have to share your, your, your Insta handle. You know, it's, it could come through books, it could come through teaching or courses, but I kind of am I'm interested in how you um, are imagining or speculating on making discoveries about a kind of broader approach to place in the built environment through travel research accessible to, to others. Uh, I can maybe share a few thoughts. Um, I mean, I, I, because this is tied into my major kind of um, research agenda in academia, I'm hoping to turn it into something more substantial than just the kind of Instagram images or uh, kind of shared thoughts throughout the travel and try and maybe coalesce everything into a publication. Uh, that addresses uh, some of the places or catalogs some of the places I have to visit uh, in person with some that maybe I, I won't be able to visit, but still uh, expand on the same themes. And I think part of the publication or the challenge of the publication will be that precisely to identify how it's represented differently for projects that you visit in person, that you do have access to, that you experience in a different way from projects that we now have access to remotely um, and have all kinds of documentation available to us, but are still not able to perceive the project maybe in the same way as visiting it in person. So I think the argument I'm hopefully making is that there's still value to seeing the project, even when they're incredibly well documented and published um, and you're able to track their construction on Instagram. Um, you, it's still worth visiting the project and um, uh, experiencing it in a different way than we can remotely. And so I think kind of having both of those uh, types of case studies in the publication will be interesting. And it's something I'm trying to think through, what do I want to document while I'm there? And how will it be different for projects that I'm not able to visit? And will there be something kind of consistent across the case studies or will they be treated differently, the ones I can visit versus the ones that are uh, no longer accessible? Of course, this is the, you know, the, the most alluring question of the moment, right? Because we've all been so tethered to our desks and our computers. It's, it's, I think it's absolutely fascinating to kind of turn the outcomes of your research, David, to this very question and kind of have a dialogue of 
um, what emerges from an on-site in situ mode of engagement with the built environment as opposed to something that's studied through digital media at some distance from it. So I think um, it's it's really exciting, but also very, very uh, relevant to, to what's, you know, the questions that will be kind of lingering after this past 18 month time period for all of us. That's so great. Yeah. Kyle, what about you? Yeah, what kind of what kind of out, outcomes are you hoping for with this? Yeah, I think I think it's kind of twofold. I think one is I want to interview, um, and I guess what has been exciting to me about um, thinking about this is that some of this stuff is only available if you go, and then I think some of it is really just um, it gives you an excuse to be intentional about something that you're interested in. So what I had outlined in my proposal was to interview this series of architects that I love, um, you know like love their work, I should clarify. Um, but I, you know, the committee said, and actually it was Peter uh, and his colleague, Michelle, who won the Latrobe Prize and put together an amazing exhibition about it. Um, they said, you know, you could interview while you're there, but you might actually want to interview over Zoom in advance because they'll, they'll tell you things that might affect your agenda, that'll give you more time to do other things while you're in, in person. Um, and I definitely, I'm not saying that there's no value to meeting people. I think there is tremendous value in like face-to-face -face time, but to not be burdened by the need to sit down and make sure I'm recording well and all my equipment's charged and all that stuff. And, and so that kind of op opportunity is available to anyone who is willing to reach out and ask, right? So I think part of what I wanna capture is that information, which is a really different grain of information than you would get in traditional architecture publication that is orthographic drawings or photos. Um, but I love that stuff too. So I think that I'm also excited about the opportunity of visiting these housing projects that I've only seen in glossy publications or that are so niche that you can't find them um, and being able to take my own photos. Um, so I think in terms of format, one of the things I've been thinking a lot about is what is a, what's the right contemporary format? I am a person that loves books and loves the kind of stability of something and the physicalness of it, but I want it to be accessible for people that can't afford to buy a book. So whether that's a website or whether that's a PDF, um, I'm trying to figure out what's the best mode because I think housing is like, maybe it's just because I care about it so much, but it feels like the urgent issue of our time. Um, and I think the projects that I'm going to look at have incredible, incredibly exciting solutions that need to be more broadly disseminated. Well, you both will have a, a, a draft run of testing out formats and things like that in, in the kind of documentation of this work at the end. And I hope you'll continue to turn to to what you record of your travel and research um, to kind of address it as though it's a it's a dry run of something to follow it that may be um, a kind of more informed version for your own you know publication purposes or website production and things like that. So um, you've done that so well, so successfully, both of you thus far in, in rounds of co competition submission. So I think you have a chance to do it <laughs> to do it again with documentation. And I can't wait to see it. It's going to be great. Um, I, I want to open it up, Peter. I don't know if you have anything else to ask. Um, you know, there, there's one incredible chat question that just came in um, from Debbie. What advice would you both give to people considering entering this competition? Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I mean, hopefully our shared experiences are encouraging. Um, we've both gone through this process multiple times and have grown and learned a lot uh, through the process. So I'd say um, it, it's a valuable experience and it's worth, worth applying. And uh, as Kyle mentioned as well, there are years that you apply and you don't make it even into the first round. And there are other years where you're shortlisted or sorry, not shortlisted, uh, runner up. So, um, and then, you know, we'll see where it goes from there, but it's certainly worth applying. Uh, it's was valuable again for me just every year to return to design competition. Um, so I encourage everyone here who certainly qualifies uh, to apply. It's a, it's a great experience overall.
There's also no entry fee associated with it, which helps to encourage the repeat, you know, attempt, I think, which is really also quite unique. I think they're um, yeah. increasing kind of, you know, prohibitions to entering certain competitions, design competitions because of entry fee increase. I'd say maybe one other thing, it's also valuable for your own portfolio outside of the Roch world. Um, I mean, Kyle's work, it's great. To, I, I know all of Kyle's competition projects <laughs> just from the Roch. Um, and I think it's great that you're able to kind of build up your own portfolio, up your own kind of design sensibility through this kind of platform as well. So uh, whether you win or not, it's still, I gained a lot from it for the first five years before I made it to that next, next stage. Yeah, I, I would echo what David said. And I, I guess um, I think it's a great way to like hone your thinking and your skills. And it's also just so inspiring to see what other people are up to. Um, and I think the BSA does a good job, especially now of putting those on the website. So even if you don't choose to compete, you can still see that work. Um, I also think, I this may be a controversial view, but I, I feel like if the, uh, if the original, like the first round brief doesn't speak to you, then I would say, take that year off. You know, like if it, if it doesn't inspire you to make a project, then you can get it in the next year. So there were years where it, it just wasn't, it didn't align with my design interest. Um, and there were most years it did. Um, and like David said, it was like, I was so excited by the projects um, that I didn't, I didn't really care if I made the finals. And, and then of course, on some of them, I look back and I'm like, Ugh, I was excited about that, but that's growth, right? Like if you look back at your work and you're, you see the shortcomings, it means you've gotten better. So I, yeah, I, I'd recommend it to anyone. Um, you know, that is not only a really interesting and critical question, but uh, the person who is asking that question, if I'm not mistaken, Debbie, Debbie McDonald is a, a past winner of the Roach Traveling Scholarship, if that's the same Debbie McDonald. Um, she was actually the first woman in the long history of the Roach to win the Roach Traveling Scholarship. So Debbie, thanks for joining us and uh, posing these questions. And I'm sure you have uh, equally deep advice to offer folks that are interested in the competition. I think to Kyle's point too, um, you can be assured that every year the prelim and final briefs will be different. So, you know, if it doesn't speak to you, if, it, if it's not something that perhaps you could you could relate to, to furthering your own speculation on a particular topic, um, visit again because it's going to be an evolution. Um, and to me, just my, my own personal involvement with this, it's been a, a wonderfully rich um, annual number of conversations about what uh, design thinking is picking up and, and addressing. So it's, it's a kind of barometer of, of pressing issues, but also of techniques and methodologies and um, scale that are all part of our conversation in crafting the preliminary and the final um, briefs for the competition stages. So um, it's, it's a, I think it, it, will, it will often be something that will resonate with many, with many approaches. Um, but if it doesn't speak to you that year, you can always revisit. What is interesting as well is that embedded in those project briefs are the research interests of the people that are writing them. So the Roach Traveling Scholarship Committee is a, a kind of rotating committee of architects and educators, generally in the Boston area. Um, and um, so for example, David, um, Amanda Lawrence, who's a professor of history at Northeastern University, uh, has been working on this idea of influence. How do architects get influenced by other architects' work? And so the idea of posing a museum for architecture to see how, the, uh, how an architect would respond to, uh, let's say, uh, influences, in your case, it was a kind of particular material evolution as you ascended through the building and such or the urban uh, responses or, or other works of architects that were not present 
um, let's say physically, but uh, present theoretically within the work. And so there is always this long shadow of the author's own interests that uh, begin to um, uh, really establish a kind of found theoretical foundation for the project briefs, which is something that we get to witness uh, as a committee from uh, behind the scenes. And it's a, it's a really wonderful kind of source of ideation that uh, comes to bear on all of the project briefs. Might have time for one more question if anyone has it or summary statements by Kyle and David. <laughs> Was that I, I was so like anxious to get through my presentation because I was trying to show so much that I forgot to thank you guys for hosting the event, for you know being so dedicated to the Roach. Um, and David, I forgot to mention that David and I went to grad school together. And I would like consistently say to people, David Costanza is just one of the best people ever. So anyway, when the two of us were in the finals together, it was like also a great chance to reconnect because you know life is busy. The other, I mean, I, that's wonderful to, to hear. And, and thank you to, to the VSA for, for hosting this and for initiating this conversation as a kind of a virtual version of, of sharing um, the incredible thoughtfulness that has gone into um, final work. Um, I will, uh, the final competition um, outcome in both of your cases is just tremendous to be able to share. Under normal circumstances, we would have a, a reception at the VSA space and um, exactly what what Kyle's speaking about the kind of you know connection among a group of peers um, who have been you know maybe sharing approaches to certain problems without knowing it is revealed live and it's part of the the kind of celebration of that moment in time. So um, I'm I'm very very appreciative of the VSA for for their willingness to coordinate a kind of virtual version of sharing the emerging projects that have come out of the past two cycles of the Roach Traveling Scholarship. Thank you. Thank you both for joining us, David, even in the middle of the dead of night from where you are. So thank you. And thank you to all our guests um, for being with us. Please do check out the BSA website and um, the website specifically more about the, the Road to Award if you continue to be interested and reach out if there are any additional questions. But um, it was a real pleasure hearing you both talk about your projects. Thank you.